Well, hello and welcome to the Profit Express. I'm Tim Healy, and I'm inviting you to join me each and every Wednesday so you can be ready to win the battle for business. That's right. That's what we do here on the Profit Express. So thanks for being on board today. And as always, a shout out and a thank you to our good friends and sponsors at Corbett Public Relations, where Bill and his team have been promoting and protecting businesses and brands for over 30 years. So visit Bill and his team at CorbettPR.com. That's C-O-R-B-E-T-T-P-R.com. Welcome aboard, everybody. Now, one of my favorite things with business success stories is where the story all began. And today's guest, Mark Hewitt's story, began in a college dorm room when he and a buddy of his decided to buy a beer brewing kit that they got from the Sears Robux calendar. And they figured, hey, you know what? It would be a great way to improve our social life and we wouldn't have to pay for beer. What's not to love? So fast forward the story a little bit. Mark graduates college and he pursues a career in finance. And his life continues. About 10 years ago, he decides to rekindle his passion for brewing beer. And he joins a local beer brewing club. So he's hanging out with his beer buddies and time goes on. And he starts to consider and think about, hey, maybe, you know what? I can open my own brewery. So he starts to think about and toy with the idea more and more. And it gets serious. And it gets so serious that he decides to leave a 30-year career in finance, cash out his 401k, and he started in 2018 Six Harbors Brewing Company with his wife, Karen. Wow, on the surface, you might think it's crazy, it's risky. It could be all of the above. That's why I know you and I want to hear how he went from brewing beer in his college dorm room closet to being the owner of a very successful brewery here on Long Island. So it's a pleasure to welcome aboard the Profit Express, Mark Hewitter, the owner of Six Harbors Brewing Company. Mark, how are you today? I'm very well, Tim. Thank you so much for having me on. Hey, no, it's my pleasure. Um, the story of an entrepreneur's success to me, I mean, we, we talk about the success you enjoy now, but it's really where did it all began? And so, so many times we hear about, you know, businesses opening up in, in garages. In your case, it started in a dorm room closet. So let's, let's get to the important facts first. How much did brewing your own beer in your dorm room with your buddy help your social life back in the day? Well, it's a funny story behind that. Um, when we had came up with the idea to brew um, in the resident hall, we started out in the commissary, a.k.a. the kitchen, and we mm -hmm. really stunk it up from making the wort. Uh, and then when we got to the final stage of uh, fermenting the beer uh, in our uh, dorm room closet, uh, we kept on getting knocks on the door. Is the beer ready yet? Is the beer ready? And uh, <laughs> one particular knock was from a, uh, a mathematician. And um, he knocked on the door. He goes, hey, Mark, is the beer ready yet? I go, hey, John, um, you're a going to be a get a bachelor's degree in mathemat mathematics, right? He goes, yeah. I go, I told you about three days ago, it's going to take about 14 days for the beer to get ready. <laughs> so 14 minus three is what? In the question mark? <laughs> and he kind of looks at me dumbfounded. It's 11. Um, so I'll be back in 11 days. Um, so that's one of the funny stories, intriguing. Um, but once we get the beer ready, um, it tasted pretty good. We made uh, two styles of beer, um, and we were a uh, pretty success on the floor. Um, everybody liked it. Um, when we had the countdown to day zero, um, our dorm room was pretty packed with people dying to try the beer. So we had a great time. And and, and this was a, a beer brewing kit from a Sears Robux catalog, so it actually worked. It was legitimate. You made real beer. Yeah, it was, well, you know, it's, uh, you know, beer in a bucket. So you, uh, <laughs> you, you know, you set yourself up, you get all the wort ready, you ferment in AK what today would be like a Home Depot bucket, five gallons, yeah. and um, you go through it and you uh, ferment at the regular temperature of your dorm room, which was a little higher than maybe a normal place because, as you know, those gases, they always stay on for heat in the wintertime that you never could shut them off. So it right. probably helped our fermentation process, which normally <laughs> takes about 14 days. 
uh, speed up pretty quick. And we had the beer. It tasted pretty good. And we had about, uh, you know, 6% alcohol. And at that time was pretty big because back in the day, upstate New York, breaking drinking Jenny cream ales, you know, at the four and a half percent, six percent was pretty good for us. Now, w- w- what were you charging? Were you guys making a couple of bucks on this? I can imagine that there had to be some, some, some high demand for this beer. Well, we did have a, you know, a line out our dorm room uh, <laughs> for people uh, wanting to hang out. So there was a, uh, uh, an entry fee to get into our, our dorm room and then also a fee to, uh, you know, sit down and have some beer with us. So back Love in the it. day, you know, the it was a whopping five dollars, right? So um, <laughs> we thought we were the uh, the new you know wolves of Wall Street back then. Right, 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 right. All right. So we we so, so so there's the humble beginnings in in the in the college dorm room. So now we fast forward. You have a career in finance that spans 30 years. You cash in a 401k, which has a lot of people listening trembling, cashing in a 401k. That seems like a big risk. But before we get into that, I know it's going to be part of the story. I know it's an important part of the story. You're in business with your wife, Karen. And it's not always easy being in a family-run business. Was your wife always on board with the idea? Um, she, yes, uh, long story short, the answer is yes, but it was over the accumulation of years because, um, we would drive through town and there's an empty building and I would say, oh, that we need this store in town. And that store would like three months later pop up, or we need this store in town, you know, this type of business in town. And that would pop up. So she finally said, when are you going to open up your business in one of these stores that you think we need? Cause you always say we need a brewery in this town, but you never really pull the trigger. So she was kind of like, you know, oh. daring me to do it. Right. So, um, I called so her up she, one she day. Was, she said, was nudging, she was nudging you along actually is what it sounds like. Well, you know, you know, what do they say? Um, you know, Fisher cut bait. Yeah. Right? yeah. So it was kind of like, um, uh, almost a dare in a way to, <laughs> right, you're really going to do this thing. And all my swimming buddies were saying, you know, you keep on talking about opening up a brewery. Are you really going to do this? Or are you just, you know, you know, blowing wind in our face about this? Right, stuff? right, so right. I called her up one day and I said, guess what? There's a, uh, there's a building for sale and I'm going to talk, talk to the broker. And she's like, yeah, you're not going to talk to that broker. Sure, sure. <laughs> and I uh, called her back about an hour later and go, um, I made an offer on the building. And she goes, you did what? You didn't consult no. me. I said, I told you I was going to go look for a building. We'll see if they make the, the bid or not. So long story short, um, they, uh, <clears throat> they took the offer after going back and forth uh, a few times. And we were the proud owners of a, uh, a building um, in, uh, in our town. And right. uh, the beauty of the whole thing, it was only three houses away. So I could walk to work every day um, when we got started. But the thing is, to get started, I was still working, um, commuting, uh, and after commuting, I would go to the building, change my clothes, and then go to my second job, which is starting to get the building restored in order to build the brewery. So at that time, I had two jobs before we really opened. So okay, so, uh, again, th- we talk about these these business success stories on the Profit Express. It's about sharing stories, just like yours, Mark, and. <clears throat> It's about reminding people, you know, th- there could be people just like you who are thinking of opening their own business and, and you know, th- they're hesitant. They haven't pulled the trigger yet. And so you're still in, in your career in finance. So you're schlepping into Manhattan. And then after that, you're working on building and developing the property and, and everything that goes into it. So h- how long of a period of time from, you know, you made the offer on the building, you have the building to you open up and you sell your first bottle of beer? How long did that take? Took about eighteen months. Um, okay. There was a lot of uh, legal loopholes that we got to go through, starting off with the town. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm the first brewery in town, so um, they really weren't sure, you know, what classification the brewery would fit into um, under their regulations for town code, because there wasn't any regulations for breweries. So I believe it or not, I had to go to the ZBA 
five different times to get everything I wanted. In fact, I had just about everything I wanted, and the last bit of it was my pa- my tasting room. And my business model, my business model was to sell beer and not distribute it through the tasting room. So even though I had the ability to sell beer in my building, I did not do that for six months until I had my final ZBA meeting and got approval to have a tasting room in my brewery so I wouldn't have a disconnect feeling between people go, oh, there's the brewery, but you can only do takeout versus the brewery where you can go in, sit down and have a beer. So believe it or not, I sat on the building paying a mortgage for six months all this equipment, all these chairs, all this furniture, all this lighting, paying those bills for six months until I actually got my approval for the tasting room and started business on May the 4th, 2018. So you have the building, you have the mortgage, you know, you're going through all the, the, the legal loopholes and nonsense, right, to figure all this out. Six months goes by. Money's leaving. Money's not coming in. I mean, that, that's that's what I'm hearing. That's the reality. Um, how were some of those nights? Was, was there any doubt in any of those nights? Any naysayers creep in? You know, believe it or not, no. Because of the legal hurdles I had to get through um, mm-hmm. on the federal la- level with the uh, TTB, the state level with the SLA, the local level, once that all came together, and mm-hmm. one of the things I've always admired about businesses, especially just taking a look at my town, I've noticed that the first business that comes into the town has the longest staying power. So I knew um, I was going to be successful because I wrote this business plan that was 27 pages and knew down to the penny the cost of everything. And I knew what my break even point is to make money and pay my bills. So I go, this getting through all the legal stuff was the tough part. Right. Getting right. the business up and running, that was the easy part. Really? And so yeah, I mean I think I, I tell people all the time, once you put your business plan in place, once you have it and once you understand it, Everything after that, all the challenges that you have, you can always overcome those challenges. It's really much believing in yourself. And you always say, yeah, I want to open up a brewery. I want to open up a brewery. People tell me all the time, oh, I'm going to open up a brewery. You go, you have a business plan? Oh, yeah, well, it's right up here. It's in my head. They go, (laughs) you're going to fail. You need to write it down. You need to look at it. You need to review it. And I probably rewrote that business plan 27 times. And and so, all right, so looked at it. This is very interesting because yeah. I've had a ton of you know business owners, entrepreneurs on the show, and there's mixed results or mixed opinions on business plans. Some highly successful you know entrepreneurs I've had on say, yeah, you know, business plans aren't worth the paper they're written on. But your approach is very interesting because you wrote it as 27 pages, and then you just said you know you edited several several times, and it sounds like because of the effort you put into the business plan, you entered into this with an awful lot of confidence in the success of the business. So you're a huge proponent of the business plan then. Without a doubt. I mean, if um, it's your roadmap to success, it's going to help you. And you look at your business plan. I look at my business plan. We're in the business going to be six years in May. And I still refer back to that business plan and take a look at it. Because on top of the business plan, I also wrote a financial plan that was another 12 pages to find out what it was going to cost. Mm. And if you give me a second, I could tell you this quick story. Um, Before I opened up my brewery, um, I was looking at um, another brewery that they were looking for investors out in Riverhead. And I said, hmm, this is interesting. Maybe I should um, maybe I should work with them and not open up a brewery. Maybe it would be better off to be an investor and I can get some really, really good working knowledge and then maybe go out on my own. So I invite these guys to come into town to talk to them, bring their business plan. We chatted. We probably talked for about two and a half hours. And I 
kind of had one more question for them. And if you ever remember the TV show Columbo, you know, the kind of the absent-minded detective. Sure, who would at the yeah. last second hit that <laughs> zinger of a question and the person would crumble and fold and they get arrested and he solved the plot. So <laughs> yep. I asked them a pretty simple question and they go, what does it cost you to make a pint of beer? And they go, well, you know, it really depends. You know, it depends on the season, the grains, the price of wrinkles. Yeah, I understand that. They got to give me a roundabout figure of oh, what it's going to cost you. And they didn't know. And they go, guys, I'm out. And they looked at me like I had three heads. They go, what do you mean? We had this great conversation. We got some synergies here. It seems like this is going to really, really work. I said, guys, if you have no idea what it costs to make a pint of beer, how do you know how much it's going to cost for that fermenter? How much is it going to cost for that CO2 system? What does it cost to put a tap system into your brewery? I had all that in my business plan after I talked to these guys. Kind of wrote my business plan down. Yeah. These guys raised $150,000 of friends and family money. And then they did a second round of funding for another $100,000. They never opened. They never opened oh. their doors. Oh. Because they wanted to build it all themselves. They wanted to build the fermenters, the tap systems, the bar, everything from scratch. These were two mechanics. They said, we could do this. We could do this on their own. They spent too much time trying to build it. And they ran out of money from paying rent and everything else. It's, it sounds like it sounds like Mark. I'm listening to to a, a Shark Tank episode. You know, one of the classic sins: know your numbers. They didn't know their numbers, and I guess you know y- your background in finance was certainly a huge asset for you in all, in this journey. Well, I'm a big believer in business plans because I was made to write a business plan every single year from yeah. my supervisors. So it just had yeah. it in me to write business plans and follow your plan and, and take a look at your plan. When I was on Wall Street, am I up to my plan? Am I ahead of my plan? Am I behind my plan? Well, how do you know what your plan is if you're going out there and people are like, yeah, you know, business plans aren't worth the paper they're, they're worth on. But, well, where's your direction? Where are you going? How do you know if you're going the right way? Right. Where's your right. road? For me, it's a roadmap to success. And it was funny because because of that experience, you burnt through those guys with one simple question. How much does it cost to, to make a pint of beer? And they crumbled and they didn't even open their doors. Wow. That's one hell of a good story right there. So, all right. So let, let's let's jump into the, the, the brewery itself. So on Long Island, for those who don't know, uh, there's over 60 breweries, Nassau and Suffolk County here on Long Island. So pretty competitive marketplace. Describe for the listener, you know, what your vision is, what you've designed, and what happens when, let's do it this way, answer this question, Mark. What happens when somebody walks through the doors of Six Harbors Brewing Company? What's the experience like? So we get a lot of comments about our brewery that they love the vibe of our brewery. Um, It's very easygoing. They feel good. We have many types of demographics of people coming through the door. We have young people. We have the millennials. We have the generation X. We have my generation coming in. So we have, you know, people coming in from, you know, six months old because they're coming with mom and dad and mom and dad want to have a beer to 60 years old. On Sunday afternoon, we'll get the husband and wife, the kids, the dog, the grandparents coming in, sitting at a table together, having some beer, running out to the food truck and getting some food and watching the football game. And everybody's enjoying themselves because they don't have to run back to the house and let the dog to go out to do his business uh, because they can bring the dog to the brewery and hang out for a couple of hours. So they feel really good about that. Um, The older folks don't feel like it's a really young crowd and they feel like they're out of place. Young folks don't feel like they're out of crowd because there's too many older people in this place. So we have a really good mesh of people uh, from a demographic standpoint coming into Six Harbors. So when you walk in that door, the first thing that you see are our fermenting tanks, these big, bright 300-gallon tanks that are holding the beer, getting it ready for it to be finished and put it on kegs and to be tapped for them to enjoy a nice, cold, local-made, 
So it, you've described a number of, you know, generations that are enjoying themselves. As you described me, it's kind of like a living room environment. You got the dog, you're enjoying the game. There's a food truck outside. It's, it's everything. It's nice and comfortable and inviting. Um, that's not too easy to do to create that sort of an environment that's that inviting. Um, how, how do you think you achieve that? Cause that's, that's enviable for a lot of businesses. How did you achieve that, Mark? Because I wanted to be Mr. Brady when I was a kid. As Brady Bunch, uh, Mr. Brady? The Brady Bunch, Mr. Brady, oh. who was an okay. architect. Right. So I went to school <laughs> for one semester for architectural engineering, and I realized that I couldn't draw a stick person. <laughs> so, and I used to go to my freehand drawing class with a ruler. But I always had the desire and will to want to be, to be an architect. So this was a perfect opportunity for me to come in and create something that I thought people would really enjoy. So even though I only had that one year of experience of, you know, or one semester of experience in architectural engineering, I still had that creative genre, if you will, of motivation to create something that would be inviting for people. And at Six Harbors, it's just not one place that could be inviting for people. We built this atmosphere where we have a conference room with a big community table that people can hang out with. We have our lounge area where we have more comfortable seating for say the older folk who don't want to sit on a stool. We have our tap room area where people can hang out at the counter at the bar and hang out. We have garage doors that open up to bring the outside in where people could sit down on the patio on the awning. We have Brewdog Alley, one of our alleyways that have doors that roll up so people could sit in and outside at one of our other conference table, we call it the in and out table, or oh. people could go out outside and sit on our picnic table. So we have all these different venues within our brewery that people can come to. And we see people come all the time and they go and they like hanging out at the community table or they want to go over to the donut table or they want to go hang out in the lounge because they want to sit on nice furniture, enjoy the little gas fireplace that we have and drink a beer. Wait, you got, you got a donut table too? Yeah, well, donut table is uh, basically a uh, 53 gallon bourbon barrel that we put a <laughs> donut around, wood around it to make it a bigger surface area for people to hang out. We call it the donut table. Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. I'm thinking food. I got donut well, on the a lot brain. Of people call us on the phone and ask us, hey, can you reserve the donut table? Because they really? enjoy sitting here. I, I like, wow. You, so, listen, for a finance guy, you're pretty creative, man. I'm impressed so far, Mark. So, all right. So you, you've you've done a, a really good job creating an environment that's obviously welcoming, inviting. Um, let's go back to the story again. You you decide to leave a career in finance of thirty years. That's a big decision. You decide to cash out your four hundred one k. You have a wife. You have I think it's three children. If I saw on the website, another big decision. A lot of people wouldn't have the gut for that. That's why a lot of people aren't business owners. So here's the question mark. When did you know that this idea was worth cashing out the 401k for? The business plan. When I realized that, you know, I saw what the break-even point is, how many pints of beer I need to sell a day to, you know, just pay the bills, to kind of get it going, to get it started. Um, that was the, that was the thing for me, that one little number right there. So going through all the revenue, all the expenses and coming down to what it's going to cost, you know, uh, to make that beer, how much I'm going to sell that beer for and how many beers can I sell to break even every day, every week, every month, every year. That's how I ran my scenarios. Um, and I looked at number and I said, on a daily basis, and I'll tell you the number, I need to sell 52 pints of beer to break even every day. That's, that, that, so, that's, that's your golden number. Right. So last year, in 2023, we sold 106,000 pints of beer. 106,000 pints. Out so of our tap room. What, what is that break? I know you've done the math. 
What is it equal a day? I did not do the math. <laughs> you didn't. Oh, you're a finance guy. I do it for do sure. I, you would right done now. That. I just, I just know <laughs> what it takes to break even, right? So I'll do it for right now for you. Let's do it right here on the Profit Express. What do we got? Right. So 106,000 pints in 2023 at Six Harbors Brewing Company, Huntington, New York. What does that equal a day? Two hundred and ninety one pints a day. Oh wow. So you're almost six times what you needed to break even, roughly. From fifty two to two ninety was three hundred. Let's go. Wow. Wow. So you know you know what's funny? This is the uh, this is an interesting part of of, of the, the story and the and the conversation so far, Mark, as to how important the business plan really is for you. Now I've I've also well, had I remember on, this. I'm sorry, I, I, I sort of you remember that's just that's just the beer, but there's other revenue to the business too. And I just factored in what the beer was because I wasn't sure that, well, how much apparel can I really sell them? You know, how much can I do with that? You know, we rent out our space. What's the revenue on that? Um, the other souvenirs that we have, the pretzels, the pizza that we have when we don't have food trucks, that's just what I call add-ons so right, i just right, broke right. out my business plan just for the beer and then over the years we added all these other additional revenue streams to the business right so all right so, so. Now, now that now you now you're six years in okay so you've kind of passed some some big milestones some big hurdles okay to, to creating some stability here as you look back at the original business plan, I think you say you kind of, you know, edit it and look at it, you know, at least annually. From the original business plan, how close were you to the predictions of that original business plan? How much of that came to fruition, Mark? So um, I went to a brewer's conference uh, in Washington before I opened, and I sat down at one of these uh, breakout sessions, and the Folks on the dais, one of the persons said, don't be afraid to give up some of your business for for, uh, for cash, meaning that, you know, take on some investors. So um, I took that to heart and I took on some friends who really wanted to get in and, you know, the business and gave them a little slice of the pie. And believe it or not, um, I had this other customer um, prospect who was interested in getting in the business, he heard about me through the local newspapers of building this brewery. And one night I'm in the brewery, it's probably about 10 o'clock at night, and I'm um, got the grinder and I'm grinding some metal in the in the on the floor. Sparks are flying all over the place. <laughs> and out of the corner of my eye, I see these these this older couple at the door, kind of like, you know, um, very shy and hesitant to come in the door. And I turned it off and like, hey, we heard what you're doing. We're big beer people. We'd love to get in. We're local. We'd love to get in on your business. So we had some conversations. It actually turns out that he's an owner of an asset management company down on Wall Street who, believe it or not, side story, I interviewed with probably about 10 years ago. I still oh, remember wow. his name because they had a very unique, different name. Yeah, yeah. And here we go, 360, you know, circle on this. Uh, we had a couple of meetings. We talked. Um, I brought him in. He, uh, you know, gave some capital to the business, yeah. um, which was great. And um, we were going through our um, our shareholder meeting uh, at the end of the first year. And he looks at the numbers and he looks at me. He looks at the numbers and he looks at me. He goes, you know, I have rarely seen this maybe one time before. But your business plan with the forecasted revenue numbers your first year number was almost identical to what the the real numbers are. He goes, wow. I can't believe how accurate you were. So once again, that's just a validation from me about business plans and putting the effort into it, garbage in, garbage out, but putting some really concentrated effort into your business plan and spitting out some numbers and not just, you know, just garbage numbers to say, hey, yeah, look how much money we're going to make in the first, second, third year. Mm -hmm. Come give me money. Right. 
because there are people who just give you money because, oh, a brewery, it's great, it's hot, I want to be involved with it. And some people will do that. Some people, yeah, yeah. like one of my shareholders, looked at my financial numbers, thought they were a little high, but when the year ended and he took a look at the, the numbers again, he goes, I can't believe you did that. So it's just a wow. little validation of putting the effort into making it happen. I, I think it's a lot of validation to putting in the effort to a business plan. Um, <clears throat> all right, let, let's take a, a let me jump back to the business model for a minute. Something I did want to ask you, I was curious about. You know, when you have products, you know, you know, retail products, food, beverage, et cetera, you know, distributing those products is is a very important consideration. I've had a number of product shows on and, you know, distribution is always a big part of the conversation. But you made a uh, real decision not correct me if I'm wrong here. You made the decision not to go the route of distribution. Why? Um, I did some distribution development with my brother-in-law, who's got a brewery in Brooklyn. So okay. I went around trying to distribute his beer. And I did that probably for about four months and mm -hmm. came to the conclusion that um, it's really, really difficult. Um, you have to um, please these folks to the bitter end to keep your beer on tap. So you got to take a look at, you know, you fast forward to 2023, now 2024, there's 60 breweries on Long Island. You go up to a local restaurant or a local bar and say, hey, I'm the new guy in town. I got a great beer. I love the taste. And like, you know, and after three or four meetings of finding the right person and getting the decision maker who's going to bring beer into that particular establishment, takes on a six stall and they call you up a week later and say, Mark, I'm done with that six stall. Like, great, I'll bring over another one. Like, no, no, no. I got seven, eight guys right behind you. Come back to me in six months and we'll do another six. So I said to myself, how can you make money doing that? That's kind of ridiculous. Trying to go out and solicit yeah. people, which takes a lot of time to uh, create a relationship with an establishment to trust you to say, yeah, I'll take on your beer. And then you're on there for only six months, you know, once every every six months for beer. You really can't make money that way. I mean, there are people who do it. They have sales guys to go out and sell. They have delivery drivers to go out and, you know, deliver the beer. They got Rocco and Bruno out there to go collect your money because sometimes they don't like to pay you on time. <laughs> they, they lose your cake. You're discounting the beer. So um, I looked at it. I looked at it. I ran the numbers. And for me to make the same amount of money selling one keg of beer here in my brewery, I have to sell 10 kegs of beer outside somewhere else. And I'm a microbrewery. I can only make so many kegs of beer a month. And for me to make the same amount of money each week, I would be out of beer. I couldn't do it. So I made the conscious decision yeah. to sell all my beer out of the tasting room at the highest profit margin that's out there. So then because you had that experience with your brother-in-law, you kind of, you know, firsthand had, you know, found out that, yeah, this isn't right for me. Uh, and actually, and again, running the numbers, because one thing we've learned about Mark Hewitt today, he's a numbers guy and he's a plan guy. Uh, and I'm loving it because uh, it's encouraging people and reminding people of the importance of knowing your numbers, for God's sakes. So you say it was actually it sounded like it was an easy decision. Distribution is not right for you. Yeah, listen, you know, Ben Franklin said, people don't plan to fail, they fail to plan. Right. Yeah, yeah, classic. Absolutely. Um, right. So so something listeners always love to hear when they, when they you know, have a show with, with a fellow, you know, business owner, entrepreneur. Um, describe for me, because you you're doing something right. We talked about your culture and, and, and what draws people in. Uh, what is the marketing strategy, the branding strategy for Six Harbors Brewing? That's a really good question. Um, when we first started building out the business, um, we had a, a golden retriever of mine that I would bring after work coming down here to do my second job. Um, buddy, he's uh, <laughs> um, our golden retriever, and he came down and he would just hang out while I'm you know, working here. And then when we 
we opened, we were always dog friendly. And by the time um, we opened, we had uh, another dog, uh, Barley. So they were the, quote, brew dogs down at the brewery. Mm -hmm. um, and so we kind of used them as our mascots, dog friendly, kid friendly. Um, people say we make good beer. I like that. Um, in a good location. Once they say location, location, location. Yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely. I'm, uh, I'm in, a, in a pretty good town here. So um, that helps. So I think um, this is plan. Um, having our dogs as our, um, our beer ambassadors, being dog friendly um, helps us, you know, in our marketing strategy. Um, we find that if we um, take a picture of one of our beers and put it on Instagram, We'll get so many likes to it. We put the uh, dogs on the Instagram page. We'll get more likes than the beer likes. But if we put <laughs> the dogs and the beer together on Instagram, we get a hell of a lot more likes. Wow. So it's not just sex that sells, but dogs and beer sell too. So now we've, 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 we've cracked the code in marketing. I love it. Well, we also take... Um, you know, the lovely ladies who like to come down and visit our dogs, and they lay on our dirty floor petting the dogs, and they have a beer in their hands and petting the dogs on the floor. We take that picture, put it on Instagram, <laughs> and then you really see the likes go up. That, that's the trifecta of, market, of marketing right there. You have beer, dogs, and women. I mean, what, what else do you need? Um, this is this has been a great conversation. This is the kind of conversation I love to have on the Profit Express, sh sharing, you know, really just you know your your strategy which got you to where you you and your 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 wife and your team are right now is tremendous um one question i always like to ask so you've been in business six years you guys have accomplished quite a bit if you had a do-over what would it be that's hard to say um we have kind of exceeded our expectations of what this has become. This is kind of um, taken over um, a lot more. Um, I guess maybe if I had to think about it, more space, because I'm running out of space. I had to reconvert my attic space to get more room. So that's, so that's a good a good problem so far, but you're looking for more space. Interesting. Is that another location or just more space at the same location? Well, um, I kind of have this business model that I have now, and <laughs> I wouldn't mind taking it and recreating it maybe in another town that's similar to the town I live in. Um, okay. Just because, um, you know, I, I need to grow, and we only have so much space to grow. So there's only so much that you can squeeze out of a lemon, right? Sure. Um, so we, we built the upstairs space, um, to help generate new business, you know, upstairs, you know, with the additional products that are up there. Um, but I wouldn't mind taking what we've created and duplicating that in another location. Um, once again, we don't distribute, so we're not in that distribution yeah. game. So to grow is to create another store, if you will. Okay. So you, yeah. you, timeline, have you, have you thought about when that might happen? We've, uh, we've been out there, you know, doing, doing work um, with the opening of the upstairs uh, just eight, eight weeks ago. That's kind of tough to look at a timeline. We want to kind of yeah, yeah, pay attention yeah. to this baby and incubate it and let it, you know, grow and, and go. Um, that's our other revenue stream. Um, we have people all the time asking us that, you know, I'd love to get in business with you and bring this to my town, um, but I can't clone myself. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm here, you know, 12 hours a day already. Are, are, are you pinching yourself a little bit? Is, is this exceeded your yes. expectations? Yeah. Yes. My yes. wife and I, um, so we sit down, um, kind of silly, but we, we have some business meetings in our hot tub. And so <laughs> we go out there. Hold on a second. Does HR know you're having business meetings in a hot tub? I don't know if that's appropriate or not. I mean, let's... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the two bosses, right? So, okay. All right. We're um, good. We're good. We're, 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 but we're, you know, we're sitting there having yeah. a beer yeah. uh, in the hot tub, 
Um, and we're just like, you're just going over stuff. It's, it's, it's kind of like our time yeah. where, you know, we still have, you know, three children, we still have three golden retrievers and it kind of allows us to kind of get away and, you know, we're stuck in this hot tub, so we can't really do anything. So it gives <laughs> us opportunities to, you know, kind of get back together, chat, yeah. reconnect, yeah. talk about the business because she runs the front half of the house. I run the back half of the house. Yep. Um, and we get to talk about our day. So we're like, you know, two ships in the night passing yeah. at the brewery because she's focused on the front. I'm focused on the back. But it gives us time to reconnect and talk about our day, the business um, and looking at our calendars on when we can take some time off because we don't take a lot of time off. As a well, business I, owner, we yeah. don't get to have a lot of time. As I, you know. I can I got you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mark, this Listen, I had been... three weeks. Excuse me. I had six weeks in, you know, the corporate world and I couldn't even take six weeks. That's, you know, two weeks every quarter, you know, almost. Oh, forget it. So oh, yeah, yeah. They can't do that. They'd fire you. You'd be, you'd be on, a, you know, out the door taking, you know, a week and a half every quarter because it's given to you. But right. now you're working seven days a week and you're scrounging, scratching your head saying, when can I take two days off just to kind of, recharge a little bit so it's actually yeah. i guess the hot tub is our recharging you, you got to do it somewhere listen it, it sounds like a great yep. idea uh mark this has been a great conversation really i i really appreciate you, you jumping aboard the profit express today uh real quick how can people follow you on socials probably the best way how can they follow six harbors six harbors brewing company.com go check out our website um and you can uh, see all the different video clips that we have from all the different uh, uh, national networks we've been on. We've been on CBS, NBC, the Kelly Clarkson show um, about our brewery and how special it is with our dogs because our dogs are the brew dogs. They're very world famous. <laughs> They've been at 13 different countries, newspapers around the world. So best place is the website. You can take a virtual tour, social media, Instagram, Facebook, X. You can find us there. There you go. Mark, it's a pleasure. Congratulations on the success. Thank you so much. Yeah, you got it. will do. Look forward to coming back and uh, talking about the upstairs when it's time. And, and, the, and the next location and, and, and the book that you're going to inevitably write one day. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, my, 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 take, my kids took me away from Instagram because I'm not the biggest person when it comes to grammar and spelling. So um, I don't know how good I'll be writing a book. That's right. You get a ghostwriter. It's, it's, it'll be good. That's true. Right. Awesome. But thank you thank so you, much Mark. for your time today. You got Feel it. Good. Take care. Bye now. And this has been the Profit Express. Keep your eye out each and every Wednesday as great shows like the one I just did with Mark Huter. He is the co-owner of Six Harbors Brewing Company with his wife, Karen. A tremendous success story going from brewing beer in a college dorm room to being a highly successful brewery here on Long Island. So check it out. If you like what you see, of course, hit the subscribe button and uh, don't forget to hit the notification button as well. And until next time, this is the Profit Express. You, me, and everybody else out there listening, let's continue to win the battle for business.